Hello, I'm Suzanne James. Welcome to the Greenleaf Show. Today is episode three of our series on the draft voluntary assisted dying bill, New South Wales 2021, to be introduced to New South Wales Parliament next week by independent Sydney MP Alex Greenwich. New South Wales Greens MP Kate Fernman is co-sponsoring the bill and has a long history with the VAD debate in New South Wales. Kate joins us now from Sydney. Kate Fernman, thanks so much for joining us today on the Green Left Show. Thanks for having me. Kate, you have been involved in the issue of voluntary assisted dying in New South Wales for some time now, including a first attempt in New South Wales legislation back in 2013. Can you share with us briefly how and why you first became involved and what your involvement is now as co-sponsor of the 2021 bill? Yeah, so when I when I first um, became interested in this issue it was actually when former Greens MP, he was the first Greens MP in New South Wales um, before Larry Annan uh, was Ian Cohen, and he was very passionate about voluntary assisted dying as well. He had a bill called the Rights of the Terminally Ill Bill, which was based on the Northern Territory um, Bill, which was the very first bill um, in Australia. When he left the parliament after serving two full terms, which was like 16 years as an upper house MP, he's from the Byron area, I took over his work. So I then spoke with a range of different advocates on the issue, as well as people with terminal illness who wanted the choice to die with dignity. That was very moving. We're talking about people with motor neurone disease who didn't have long to live, people with multiple sclerosis who had been bed bound and unable to move for you know, five to six years that really wanted that choice as well. So I took that on. In 2013 was when I introduced the bill to the New South Wales Parliament and, unfortunately, it did pass at that time. Okay. The concerns have been raised by some VAD advocates that the appointment of Dominic Perrottet might be a good thing and initially looked like it might be for the movement because Premier Perrottet had said she wouldn't allow a conscience vote in this term of Parliament. Perrottet said he would allow the vote even though he wouldn't vote for it himself. He then backtracked a little on that and said, well, it's still a matter for the party room. What's your view on what his appointment does to the VAD argument? And how do you think that's going to play out? Why do you think that is? Well, look, if he, if he has committed to ensuring a conscience vote, of course, that is a very good thing from the Liberal Party's perspective. The Greens don't need a conscience vote. It's in party policy for voluntary assisted dying. But for those, for those parties that do, I think it's good. It frees up those MPs who want to vote for this very compassionate, um, sensible, long overdue reform. I think it's, it is worrying that... Perite's um, appointment may embolden, if they need anything further to be emboldened by, but emboldened the hard right Catholic um, opposition uh, to this. Mm-hmm. Having said that, you know, I, I think I recall back in 2013, uh, George Pell at the time writing to all MPs, telling them how um, how much of a danger my bill was. So we can certainly expect a lot of we can certainly expect a lot of lobbying by the uh, Catholic opposition, when I say Catholic, particularly the hard right Catholic. However, I have been assured that there is certainly uh, a lot of support in the lower house. I I do think um, it is looking like we potentially can get that, that support. The only thing just to caution here that sometimes coalition or conservative governments can say or parties can say that their members have a conscience vote and then there's actually moves behind the scenes to pressure people around pre-selection uh, to lobby people to adopt a different position to potentially what they were going to do mm-hmm. we've seen the hard right in new south wales in recent days obviously get a um uh, get a boost uh with with dominic perite so that's of a concern. Um, I suppose we can only wait and see in that regard. Um, But my overall view after speaking to people is I I do think hopefully we will get through this through the, the, the lower house. Can I say as well, we don't know. It's also what these stakeholders and the lobbyists like that I've referred to are going to do. They go absolutely feral, as we uh, know and as we have seen in other states. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
And I will say this, uh, I had in 2013 Dominic Perrottet's sister-in-law sneak in to a briefing that I had a private briefing with doctors, with MPs and staff, snuck in, got the information, the next day phoned the university of a doctor who was briefing to basically try and wreck his career, saying he was telling MPs that he had actively chosen to end patients' lives. It was a lie. She did it to try and wreck his career. This is a relative of Dominic mm. Perrottet. This is what we're talking about in, in how hard they will play, how hard they will go to try and stop progress on this issue. Anything to give the people what they want. Absolutely. <laughs> Alex is saying he intends to introduce the bill as early as next Thursday, 14th of October. Are things on track for that? Can you briefly outline for us what happens next, how long that whole process might take to the final vote? Yes. So Alex will have to introduce it. He gives notice of it, if you like. Then he has to wait for the next time to give um, a speech to it. Um, then it comes on for a second read debate in the lower house. Now, that could take some time, as we have saw the days it took for abortion law reform, as we've seen any progressive social reform. This, this takes a little bit more time than a government bill because Basically, the private member or the independent Alex Greenwich has to give notice of it. Then he, he will need to give his second read. Then it's kind of put on hold, if you like, until it comes up again for other members to second read it. Now, that will need to be done, I think, with the consent of the, the, the House to do. Um, hopefully, that will happen. I'm hearing that there is uh, the mood to get it done before the end of the year in terms of the vote. That could take a couple of days, though, in terms of everybody giving their second reads to um, the bill because it's not a matter of, you know, the government minister and an opposition and a couple of the crossbench speaking to it. So that could take a couple of days, as did abortion law reform and any other kind of progressive, very scary social reform that um, that uh, uh, comes through this place. The, um, the upper house uh, could also take a little while. Um, but hopefully we will see it done, may, you know, before the end of the year. I think it could be, say, two weeks of parliamentary kind of time, if you like, from the lower house, the upper house, while we're, con you know, focusing on different things while the other house is dealing with things. But overall, it could be, it could be two weeks. I'm hoping it'll be done because we finished parliament this year at the end of November. So it could, it, you know, fingers crossed it's before then. Fingers crossed indeed. Yeah. It's about 80% public support for voluntary assisted dying. Um, it's been available in all other states, territories accepted. Obviously, we've just seen recently Michaela Cash's response to people in the Northern Territory still seeking to revisit it there. Um, the stringent safeguards are all working well. It's always had the support of the Nationals. You've already outlined the tactics some people have chosen to use to try and prevent this legislation from becoming law. A lot of support, though, has been expressed, hasn't it, during this consultation process? And um, Alex Greenwich and yourself obviously be talked to a lot of people behind the scenes. Well, it'd be great to think that this time we will get the democratic outcome. Yeah, I honestly. But not always that simple. What do you think its chances are, all things considered, now with the Perite uh, government? And what do you think people in New South Wales can still do between now and when the vote is on to make their? support for the Bill 9. With, with, with something like this, an issue like this, you have to contact your local MP and tell them where you stand and make sure to contact uh, all the MPs in the upper house as well. That's, uh, that's crucial. We don't know, for example, where the shooters stand on it. Um, there may be, and, for, and One Nation for that matter. I think we can, you know, we've got... Um, I assume, you know, all the Greens, of course, there's others. There are some people within Labor who come from the kind of, you know, right of Labor, the Catholic right, if you like, who will never support it either. But I don't think we can rest on our laurels until we uh, really hear from people directly. I would urge people to do what they can to contact their MPs. Also, if people have stories, the thing that really moves people on this issue generally, unless you kind of come with a uh, kind of solid view about this being the principal thing to do in terms of people being able to have the choice if they're terminally ill to choose to be able to end their lives when they can with control and dignity with people, their loved ones around them. For me, that 
I didn't really need a personal example to have felt that and to be very solid on it. I think a lot of MPs, though, do come to the party, do change their mind when they experience a loved one going through absolute hell at the end of their lives. So if you have that story, if you have friends that have been in awful situations, it's very important to tell that story when you're lobbying your MPs about this. It's the number one thing that changes minds, of course. Kate Berman, thank you so much for taking the time to update us on the New South Wales BAD Bill and best of luck to you and Alex for its success. There's been a lot of hard work going into it and I know a lot of the advocates that we've spoken to recently very much appreciate the work that you do. I recently interviewed Shane Higson from Dying with Dignity. I believe you and Shane know each other quite well. Yes. Um, also Beverly Baker from the Older Women's Network. Their recent AGM came out and publicly supported Voluntary Sister Dying and that the law that that bill should become law so thanks so much for taking the time to give us the latest and best of luck to you and alex with it thank you so much for your interest and yep fingers crossed we could have dying with dignity in place legal by the end of this year thank you so much kate i'm suzanne james thanks for joining us on the green lab show